Hi, this is Ken Gidge, and this is Gidge World. And today, the President of the United States came to the city of Nashua, and several people went who were Democrats, but I'm a Democrat, and I didn't get invited. And, you know, there's like five or six of us, and we didn't get invited. And maybe the Democrats should start thinking about who gets invited, especially to those things. Maybe I wouldn't have gone, but maybe I would have gone, but it would have been nice to have been invited. Since there's only 103 of us throughout the whole state, and there's only five in Nashua, I understand two people uh, got tickets, but we won't uh, talk about that too much because it's... But listen, if I was a Republican, and if this was a Republican president coming to the state of New Hampshire, would the Republicans have all the Republicans there? Probably. Oh, by the way, someone from the White House did call me this morning, but I didn't take the call, so I just thought I'd start to show off like that. And our guest tonight, who didn't want me to talk about this at all because he thought that I didn't get invited, but I really did get invited, uh, is David Campbell. Hi, David. Hi, Ken. How are ah, you? you see? Yeah, nice surprise be, be, ending there. Before yeah, the show. Yeah, there you go. There before you go. The show. Oh, don't talk about that. Uh, you, gotta get, you call me a bomb thrower? Is it Obama or a bomb? Did I say no, you said bomb. I throw... Oh, okay. Well, who? I know who you are, but and I'm sure there's. I call you the governor, anyway. As you as you know, I I say this. Here's the governor, simply. And I say governor when we're at the state house, simply because you look like a governor, you act like a governor. But I'm talk, a state rep. Talk from like Nashville. a governor. Yeah. In what ward? Our uh, ward six. And how long have you been? This is my fourth term from Nashua. When I was a very young man. When I was uh, 21 years old, my hometown of Newport, where I grew up, born and raised in Newport, New Hampshire, I served two terms. I took a term off from college. In those days, it was, a, it was every other year. It was a biennial situation. So I took a term off from college and uh, served, a, served a one term in the legislature while I was in college, and then uh, did one more after college, and then I got smart and went out and got a living, made a living. Ah, you went to Harvard, I take it? I, I did, yeah. And you... Bottom of your class, or uh, no, no, I actually graduated with honors. But I, uh, but after I got out of college, I came back to New Hampshire and came to Nashua right away. In fact, then I then I went to a law school at Suffolk at nights, actually, while I was working here in Nashua. First for the mayor, uh, who was Morris Sorrell at that time, and then I uh, sold uh, commercial industrial real estate for three or four years during uh, during my time as uh, in law school, and then I became a lawyer and. Worked hard for 20-something years, and uh, still am working hard, just the recession's uh, not cooperating. Everybody's, uh, everybody's out there struggling. Still in real estate? Do real estate law and real estate corporate law. But it's, uh, it's slow right now. It's slow, and the economy uh, is, uh, is picking up, I think, but, uh, but slowly. It was, a big, it was a big hit, worldwide recession. Uh, as, a, as a state rep, uh, oh, uh, Telegraph today, maybe, maybe you saw it. Uh, we ended up with a, a, a plus, not a negative in money for the last term. Did you know that, $18 million? Maybe you didn't hear, hear about I it. I didn't hear that, but... Uh, it wouldn't surprise you. I, you know, the, the revenues could be up a little bit, and, the, and probably that's why, just because the, 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 uh, the leadership, the Republican leadership, uh, downplayed the revenue estimates. So I'm, I'm not shocked that they're a little higher, but wish they were higher. The snowless winter did not help our, our state revenues. No, it, no, it didn't. But we we, we closed. Uh, didn't help business. Didn't help business profits tax. Didn't help anything. You know, didn't help the economy and the local economy and people looking, to, you know, to get back to work. It just didn't help. And by the way, we're sitting here and is what the second snowstorm of the seasons outside. The first really of the winter. The last one was. That's the, right. The one was in October. My grandfather, who was an old Yankee from up north, said used to say, "I've never seen a winter rot in the sky yet." Well, this one almost did, but. But this, this winter, we finally got our storm. Yeah, well, I, I, I have a feeling we, we, are going to, uh, we, we are going to see uh, a little bit uh, more snow. But this is awful. I, I was thinking a lot of people who, who are in real estate, uh, builders, they put the snow plows on their trucks, and you know, that's how they get through the winter. Yeah, I know a lot of friends who snow plow for a living, and they have made a lot of money this winter. So they're, they were happy to see it, I think. Oh, yeah. Um, we sort of forget about that, that uh, though I know a lot of people are happy that there is no snow, but when you stop and think about it, uh, it is important. And also our ski areas, uh, they did get more up there, I heard, a little bit more than we got down here. And snow machines now are so, so consistent. So, uh, the skiing has been great all year. I mean, I haven't gone, but I have friends who do. My sister skis regularly, and they say the mountains are great where the snow is made. Sunapee's got one of the best snow-making operations yeah. in the 
in the state, in the, in the region, in the East, actually. They win, I think, the seventh year in a row, they won the best snowmaking in the East. But if there's not snow on the ground, it's an old, I mean, I used to be from that part of the state, and if it isn't snowing in Boston, it isn't snowing to where all the people are, they don't come skiing. Well, uh, so you did see the president today. I, I couldn't make it. I didn't make it. Tell, I tell us about it. Well, he had a speech today basically talking about energy, energy independence, how important it is. Um, in fact, uh, he, they distributed a graph. I think I have a uh -huh. copy of it. They had a graph that they had up behind the president. And uh, this was a White House visit, not a campaign visit. Um, but uh, they were talking about the US dependence on foreign oil as a percentage of domestic consumption. And how in 2005 and 2006, it was at 60%. This is during the George W. Bush administration. 2007, it went down to 58. 2008, 57. But uh, during Obama's time, it's gone to 52, 49. And now it's, it's for, at 45% is the percentage that we import of oil. So the other point he made today, I think that was interesting, is they talk about the, the solution to prices of oil of oil and gas, which is catastrophic again. It's, coming, it's going up again. They say it's headed for $5. But the, the point that he made is that uh, the United States uses 20% of the oil in the world that's produced. And we have reserves of 2 to 3%. Right now, we're about 2 But say we drill everything we can, we bid at 3%. So that disparity is not going to ever make up the difference. The, unfortunately, the demand in oil right now is there's probably there's two factors. One is the foreign demand. Uh, Brazil, China, and India are the three big users of oil. China is number one. Um, and beyond that the, is speculation in the market, Wall Street. You know, people speculating on the price of oil going up. Those two factors drive that up. The United States used to be control commodity prices. Now we're kind of the tail, not the dog wagging the tail. And that's a problem. And that's not just a problem for oil, for steel for salt, for copper, for a lot of commodities. We see the prices going up and up and up. And uh, we can't do much about it. And it's, it's a bad thing for our economy. It's a bad thing overall uh, for, I think, uh, development in the future. Building new roads, building new buildings, very difficult because the costs have just skyrocketed, even during a recession. When wages are down, when jobs are down, prices keep going up in, commo in the commodity world. Well. Um we keep saying we're first. We're not first. And lots oh, of we're things. first in a lot of things. A lot we, of things. We have yes. the best economy. We, it's just that you know we are. The, the the Chinese are putting 10 million new cars a year on the road, so they are consuming more. There where we were in the 50s. We're still the strongest economy, the strongest military, the best place to live. All those good things. But there are economic forces in which we are no longer the leader, and that's that's a problem. Uh, uh, my son is in China, and he is teaching English, and he just moved to a city close to Hong Kong, so I looked up Hong Kong. Uh, I didn't know this, but there's more Rolls Royce and Bentleys in Hong Kong than any place in the world. I believe it. So uh, if you're uh, a Chinese individual, or anyone, uh, pilots, have you, have you heard about the pilots? Uh, pilots here in the United States make approximately, when they start off, is $115,000 a year. Uh, Chinese pilots, so they're starting them off at 165 a year plus housing. So where are our pilots going to go? To China, I guess. <laughs> yeah. So a uh, lot of people here today. Yeah, it was a, it was a big crowd. Uh, it, they could have they could have fit a few more in only because the storm I think kept it down, but it but it made the crowd uh, manageable and not like sardines. Big crowd though. Um, excitement? Is it in the air? Last time it was. Uh, I'm trying to, I didn't go today. I'm sorry I didn't. Yeah, it was an enthusiastic crowd. It, w it was. And it was open to the public. First come, first serve. So, it's, you, know, it's, you know, pretty much uh, I think the, the enthusiasm was genuine. Good. Um, why don't we start talking about a little bit of the national politics and then come back to New Hampshire. Uh, Satorum made, uh, and you certainly are uh, a, a lover of JFK. Uh, he's been one of your, your big heroes. Uh, when you hear somebody make a statement such as uh, the talk he did about his religion, uh, Satorum basically said he, the uh, speech was so bad he almost vomited. Uh, would you like to talk about that? Did you hear about that? I did. Um he was talking about uh, separation of church and state, wasn't he? Kennedy's famous speech yes. about that. 
Well, I'm not a big Rick Santorum fan. I guess that's no, no, no secret. And I think some of the things he's saying shows a lack of discipline as a national candidate and is pretty much outrageous in terms of, you know, looking into the inner mind of the man. Uh, I heard him say that uh, because Obama said he wanted everybody to have the opportunity to have a college education, he said, what a snob. And then, then at uh, his uh, concession speech to Romney the night, he was bragging about his 93-year-old mother, dear mother, uh, saying she was a college at graduate. And I was thinking, does that make her a snob? <laughs> yeah, I know. I, and I, I saw that. And he sort of like uh, tried to pull back a little from that. But, uh, but uh, you know, that's, that's who he is. Um, I, you know, I don't think he, he did very well in New Hampshire. I mean, New Hampshire Republicans even supported him very, very widely. Michigan, Romney, uh, 15 uh, electoral votes. Uh, Santorum, 15 electoral votes. What's going on with Romney? Well, that's Romney's home state. I remember George Romney we ran for president in 1968. I think he came to my hometown of Newport back then. George Romney was his father and, uh, yeah. and, and former governor of, of Michigan. And uh, kind of surprising uh, that uh, he did, did, didn't do well there. I mean, it, it, it's funny how the spotlight has gone through pretty much every single candidate who's running on the Republican side. At one point, they've all been the front runner, if you think about it. That's right. Every single one of them. Gingrich, your opinion? Gingrich. Uh, He's been there, done that, and people kind of know his act. Is he the smartest of them all, do you think? I think he's the most politically adept. I don't know if that makes him the smartest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, any of the candidate, candidates uh, uh, that have dropped out that you thought probably should have stayed in the Republican Party? No, I mean, I'm, I mean, just observation. I mean, the ones that dropped out early never got a chance to be a front runner. All the rest of them were at one point, if you think about it. Uh, the governor of Texas. Uh, uh, Gingrich had his day, uh, Ron Paul's had his day, Romney, just goes, goes on. Now Santorum, and it's gone. Like, it, it's, it's like the media and the Republican Party itself uh, can't decide who they want because I don't think they really like any of them, so they keep switching horses. They, they got to settle on one eventually. Ron Paul, that's, that's interesting because, uh, as you probably know, there's another state rep who has a TV show up in Manchester, and uh, he never takes calls, but they decided to, to take calls that night, and they had like 50 calls from, they were all Ron Paul. So Ron Paul uh, followers uh, are pretty strong people. Well, he's, he's a libertarian, and he's got a strong libertarian following, um, believes in very limited government and individual rights, you know, Having, having swayed, but, and a lot of people, a lot of viewers will say, well, that sounds like a good thing. But they may disagree because he's in favor of legalizing marijuana, for instance. And that's one reason he's such a young, fervent fan base, I think, or supporter base, I should say. Uh, and that's one of the reasons, is because he wants to, he wants to legalize marijuana. Um, so for those single issue people, <laughs> that's a very important issue, and uh, he's got a lot of supporters. But he is, he is generally libertarian, and um, I, you know, I just, you know, it's hard to see him as a viable candidate, but he, but he does well in every single state. He has a huge following. Someone like Ross Perot back in, what was it? 90, yeah, he's like a 90, rock star to 90, a degree. 92, was it, yeah. Ross Perot? Yeah. Romney made the statement that he, every place he goes uh, at, at every campaign, uh, uh, every time he does a campaign speech, there are more Ron Paul signs out there than his. Right. Uh, so they're very, very, very strong Ron Pauls. What did you make of the... Uh, Governor from Texas getting in, into it. Could you figure that out? Or Well, he thought he was qualified. He certainly, you know, came out strong. And, and again, you know, he just had his, he had his 15 minutes and he was gone. Uh, President, Vice President, strong, do you think? Uh, where are the weaknesses? For Obama? Obama. Uh, is Biden, a, I, I think Biden's an asset. I think Biden's been a good vice president. Uh, the economy, you think that's going to bring him down? Well, I, I think people recognize that the economy, you know, is, isn't the president's fault. The economy crashed, you know, before he became president. And the fact that he's, I think he's been doing remarkably well with, with what he has to deal with. And um, I think his policies have been good. And I think it's shown up by the fact that more jobs are being created. The economy is you know, slowly coming up the right way. Unemployment, you know, continues to decrease. And I, I, I just think overall, uh, it's going to be pretty hard to go with, I guess, the two remaining candidates versus Obama. 
but uh, that's why we have elections, and we'll see what happens. Should be fascinating. I think that there are, uh, I'm out there, and when people do not know I'm a Democrat or a state representative, I, I get this awful, this mean-spirited people when the Obama's name comes up. And I, I want to shake them and say, look, he stepped into a, a hell of a mess in Romney. I mean, saying that the president made a mistake or, or he wouldn't have helped the, the automakers out, that's crazy. Yeah. Well, I mean, if we, hadn't, if, if we let the automakers go bankrupt, it would have been, I think, disastrous for the economy. And it had ripple effects right down Daniel Webster Highway and every, in every hometown in, this, in the country, you know. And now it seems that they've, they've, got, they've gotten back on their feet and they're paying back their loans. So I, I, guess, uh, I, I guess that's the... People also, you know, are mad about the bailouts, but the biggest bailouts, which are bailouts of the banks, didn't come on Obama's watch. They came on George oh, W. Bush's Oh, no, watch. they will. They will have... I mean, they came on the other watch. Oh, I know that, but you know, but as time goes on. People forget <clears throat> that, but that, that is true. Uh, so early, so mean-spirited in commercials, uh, Romney against uh, Santorum, Santorum against Romney, uh, Gingrich against them all. It's very mean so, so early. Well, unfortunately, it seems to be that way. Just politics in general seems to be getting more and more mean-spirited. I think we're, bad times probably bring out bad behavior as well, but, you know, just... Generally, I mean, again, I had two political careers, and if you call them political careers, being in the New Hampshire House is a citizen legislature, and it's really a volunteer job. It's not much different than being on a planning board or, or, or a local zoning commission, but it, but it is it's a volunteer job. And again, I was involved when I was when I was young, between 21 and 25, and I came back 22 years later. One of the jokes I like to tell people is when I left, I said I left the legislature. I was 25 years old. I was one of the youngest members, and I left, and I and I came back 22 years later when I was like 47 and and people, uh, people said, well, so what's, what's the biggest difference? Said, well, when I was there, I was young, and I came back. I'm I was one of the youngest people there, and when I came back, I'm still one of the youngest people there. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and that's still true. But, I mean, that's part of it. I mean, we have a very conservative legislature. But 20-something years ago, or 28 years ago, whenever I was there, there was more civility. Republicans and Democrats disagreed, as they do now. But there wasn't this, this uh, meanness, this ferocious behavior towards one another. Um, we didn't have caucuses every single day. Every single session day, we have a caucus. Republicans get together and Democrats get together. And they go through every bill and tell us pretty much how to vote. We don't have to vote that way, but they kind of are telling us how to vote, the Democrats and the Republicans, the leadership, which neither you or, or I are part of. But however... That, that's a good that, point. But, we will but, talk about but that. You, but, <clears throat> but you go way back, you go way back, and we never, we, we would have caucuses, Republicans and Democrats, maybe every three or four sessions when a big bill came up. I remember the Equal Rights Amendment came up as an amendment to the Constitution, and that was a very partisan issue, and everybody put on their donkey hats and their sure. elephant hats, and then <clears throat> we did war. But it just, there was just this, but for most part, we let the committees do their work, common sense ruled, and New Hampshire, through the years, and we've been mostly Republican-led legislatures, but even those Republican-led legislatures, there's been a civility and a decency in our government and how we treat people, which I just see has been lost somewhere in the shuffle here in the last couple of years. Well, we, I've mentioned this on the show before. One of the very first bills, if you went to the LSRs, was uh, a, a bill for bullying. And when I talked to people about it, they said, well, you know, we, we don't want kids to, to bully one another. Come to find out it's actually against the Speaker of the House who supposedly bullied somebody. And it was a Republican who put the bill in. Also, uh, uh, Ros Roswell also uh, uh, was on, on it. Uh, Cindy uh, was on the bill. We, we talked about it a little. Yep. Isn't, that, we, isn't that pretty bizarre? That, yes, I yeah. mean, just to the to the point where we're at. I, I'm not sure if people understand how bad it is when you when you get a bullying bill, not for kids, but for people, elected officials. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I have mixed feelings about it. For for kids, I I totally agree. We shouldn't be kids should not be bullying each other, and we should try to stop it. And uh, but uh, as far as legislators go, I mean, you know. We have to be tough-skinned to be in this business. I'm oh yeah, but that's—I think that went a little, little too right, far. Right. And 
that's uh, hopefully what I'm trying to say is, and I hope it comes across, is, is it's that divided. It is divided. It's partisan. But it works both ways. It works both ways. I mean, Democrats, when, when we were in power, we believed, our leadership believed, I think we were going to be in power forever. We had a mandate from the people that they believed would last and last. And uh, I, I think some bills were put in. I know some bills were put in that, they, that I disagreed with, that, that, that I think the people uh, revolted against uh, in terms of, uh, you know, LLC taxes and campground taxes and, you know, balloon bills. There were certain things that, that shocked kind of the sensibilities of New Hampshire people. And I think that's one of the reasons we didn't do as well. However, so they said, you know, between that and what's going on in the national economy, nobody with a D next to their name, not many of us, got elected last time. In fact, three out of four of, of House two numbers. seven to 103. Right, but before that, it was 225 Democrats. So it was a huge loss of seats. Well, now we're looking at something that may rival that going back the other way because the Republicans have gotten in, and now they believe that they have a mandate. They believe that they're going to be in forever. They believe that their, their beliefs were somehow vindicated or validated by the, uh, by the votes uh, of the last election. And I don't think a lot of the people knew who they were electing in terms of the actual person and the actual background. They knew they were Republicans and they didn't want Democrats. That's clear. You know? well, you're, you're, you're trying to be too much of a politician because you're, you're correct. When we had, uh, we, when we were the majority, we did do some things that I wasn't happy yeah, with. Yeah, well, there's not many Democrats, but, I, I don't say you can say that, Ken. There's not many Democrats that will admit that. <laughs> I'm saying, you know, we, didn't, we did some things. You know, I, I recognize those things myself. I remember I, I sponsored the bill to rescind the LLC tax, and the governor first didn't support it. And finally, the governor came out and said he was going to get rid of the LLC tax. LLC tax. Mm -hmm. I mean, so there was things that we did which weren't, weren't, good for the state. But my point but is now, the but, extreme. Well, now I'm saying the other side is, now the other side's in charge, and the extremism here makes what, what the Democrats did look like child's play. That's I mean, exactly what I was trying to right, get. Right, right. I'm saying, and, and you can go across the gambit. I mean, we have bills, several bills in the legislature that want to change the way the balance of power works in the government. And this is an ancient doctrine we've had, you know, the separation of powers, the, the, the balance of power doctrine is, you know, we have a judiciary, we have a legislature, and we have an executive branch. And, and the balance of power, the separate and equal branches, has been a founding, it's been part of the foundation of not only our state government, but our federal government for 200 years. And I don't think anybody voted anybody into office to change that two years ago. I mean, it works pretty well. We've got a legislative branch that can pass laws, and the executive can veto them. Right? That's, that's one check. That's correct. The legislature can override a governor's veto if they have two-thirds. And the Supreme Court of the judicial branch, they can declare a law that's already approved by the legislature and by the governor unconstitutional. It's that by-play, it's that, it's that balance of power that has kept our nation strong and and moving and been emulated by hundreds of countries across the world. Now that is, a, that is under attack in our legislature, in New Hampshire legislature. Our New Hampshire legislature, New Hampshire's constitution is older than the federal constitution and has the same precepts, the same balance of power. And it's, it's a travesty to think that New Hampshire's grand tradition of being one of the original 13 states uh, and having its own state constitution and, and being a big part of the, the federal constitution that that's all being, being attacked by, by certain members of the current legislature. I, I remember we sent a House concurrent resolution down to the Congress that we voted on almost two to one. And the gist of it was that we were saying that states' rights are superior to the federal rights. And had we sent that piece of paper down to Congress, we would sent it down like two months ago or last session. But had we sent that down in the 1860s, we'd have been, we'd have been a Confederate state. And that, and, and that just irked me. I can remember thinking about the Hall of Flags and all those pennants with torn, torn ba banners and blood-stained banners from, from New Hampshire men who died in defense of the Union. And now we have a group of people in 2012 uh, saying, hey, the Confederacy was right. 
that just, that just doesn't sit well with me, and I'm sure it doesn't sit well with, with voters, but they don't know about that. They don't know about it. They don't know about it. They don't know about it. Know about it. And uh, uh, there's, there's a bill coming up that uh, I think you probably may know more about it than I, and that is the House wishes to nominate those who will be running for Senate or Congress. Uh, to keep that within the House. And that takes away basically from the voter where there is no uh, primaries. Uh, well, the biggest problem with that is I think, it's a, I think it's a 26th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which says that, that they have to be voted, that, that congressional seats have to be voted directly. How so so, I, so, so I, whatever we do here is not going to be constitutional. How in a, how in a world did, did uh, I think the Republican Party got hijacked. I really do. And I... I we know, we both know Republicans, et cetera. We, we have a lot of friends up there that we talk to. And, and I grew it, up in a town, my, half my family's Republican. My, my town was, was half Republican. I mean, uh, my, some, my best friends are still Repo Republicans and Democrats. It's not, nothing to do with party. But the people that are up there, I don't think a lot of them are Republicans. I think they're free staters. Uh, I think they're Tea Party people. I think they're nihilists. What is a free stater? I mean, the, well, a free stater is somebody who believes that uh, government has no role. We shouldn't even. I mean, they're anti-police. They, they, you know, they believe everybody should be armed with their own militia, should be a, a, a citizen's militia, and that everybody has a right to defend themselves at all times. Some of these gun bills. I've always been a Second Amendment guy. I hunt. I have a hunter, hunting license. I, I can't support bills that the attorney general, the state police, the the the, the Police Chiefs Association all oppose for pu very public safety. Um, for instance, one of the bills that passed the House, I don't think it's going to pass the Senate, but basically is that uh, anybody 18 years and older can conceal a weapon without, without a, a permit. permit. Now that, that means anybody 18 years and older. That means they don't need a permit, they don't have to go check with the police chief. That means they could be mentally ill, they could be uh, you know, a juvenile delinquent, former juvenile delinquent, they're 18. Uh, that's a terrible bill. I mean, we don't have gang violence in this state. The quickest way to get it is to let a bunch of young 18, 19, 20-year-olds run around with guns under their belts. I mean, that's, that's not a good thing. At the same time, we passed another bill, uh, which was uh, the Stand Your Ground bill. And basically, this one, I remember I got from Spoken on the Floor against this one. This one said, basically, that you have the right any person in the state, not, not a homeowner, not a landowner, any person in the state of New Hampshire, that can be an out-of-stater included, has a right to defend themselves and where they are if they feel threatened. And my analogy was, so if some, some uh, young men from Lawrence, Mass. come up and take over a bench on, uh, on Main Street in Nashua one day and decide that they're sitting there and anybody comes by they, and they feel threatened, they have a right to brandish their weapon, and defend themselves. Now, that doesn't seem like, like very sensible legislation to me. <clears throat> and, I don't, and I don't know a single sportsman, hunter, Second Amendment advocate who isn't really out there that thinks that's a good idea. And the police chiefs were against it. The state police were against it. And you know, public safety is, is, is something that, that has become secondary to, to, this, to a group of them that believe that they know and have been ordained with the knowledge what the Founding Fathers meant and, and we're trying to go back. I mean, it was, there was one bill that we had, to, we had to go back to the Magna Carta. You know, we, we, had, we had to recognize the Magna Carta. The Magna Carta was signed by King John. King John, Robin Hood's King John. And he, he signed it, uh, and he signed it at the behest of the Norman lords. And it, the reason it's important in the history of the world is the first written declaration of rights against a monarch. But the people doing the declaration are the feudal lords who are suppressing the serfs and uh, who are Normans, who 300 years before were Vikings in their longboats. So this is not really something that's kind of in the American tradition, I don't think. I'd stick with, uh, you know, Jefferson and Adams and... And it's amazing how uh, you're saying Jefferson and Adams, that's what they use. Oh, I know. That's what they say all the time. Oh, yeah. Uh, free staters, how'd they get here? This is an interesting. Well, I think we, what we just said. I don't think the, I think the Democrats... Uh, oh, they chose to come here. The well, free staters got together and decided to pick on either Vermont or New Hampshire well, and to come up and try to take over government. Well, I, I, I think it's true because we have a volunteer legislature. 
and we have very small districts, uh, that it's easier to get elected here than most places, and a lot of people can come in and with some hard work, uh, you probably can get elected here. And these are the, the, the people that we were just talking about that had some of these bills out there? Some of them, yeah. Some of them, uh, yeah, a lot of them have come from out of state. I agree with that. I mean, I was born in the state. I don't know about you, but, uh, it, but it's, it's, I, I grew up for 50 years. And I was thinking today, you know, that for 200 years we've had a form of government in this country that no one's kind of messed with. We all, we all believe, we may disagree on the issues, but no one's saying we've got we to gotta dissolve the forms of government that keeps this thing all balanced and working. And, and I've lived a fourth of, of, of quarter of that time, 50 years, or half a century under that. And, and now we have people who have been in power for two years, most of them are freshmen, and they've decided they're going to change, change our, form of, our form of government, not just the issues. Well, I'm, I'm happy that people come into the state. I was born in Nashville. In fact, I live on the same property that I was born on, just a different house on the same property. So it's my whole life. Uh, and yes, people do come into the state. Absolutely, and we want them to come into the state. I mean, we have a good quality of life. The state has grown because of that. But I'm, I'm talking about people coming to the state just in order to change, change our government. They come, here, they come here with a political agenda, not to come here to live oh, here. Oh, yes. And, 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 that's, and, and that's unfortunate. It is also their right. And it's interesting, how right. They, it's interesting how they would choose the Republican Party. So in other words, when I've, I've said this many times, that I think the Republican Party has been hijacked. I just don't think a lot of, them, a lot of people understand and know it. But well, to, well, the, I, I think you're right, Ken, and I think part of that is is that you won't get a lot of Republicans saying what what we're saying right here. It's easy for us; they'll say, "Ah, oh, they're Democrats. Forget it." Well, the fact is, a lot of Republicans don't dare say this because they're gonna they, they'll have somebody running against them in a primary, or they will be ostracized, or so we'll see. The pendulum swings, and, but but New Hampshire has had a long tradition under mostly Republican leadership, and sometimes Democrat leadership of common sense good judicial precedent, and I don't think, uh, I'm hopeful that two years is not going to upset that apple cart to the point where, where it can't be repaired. Well, I, I guess the point I'm trying to make is that there are a lot of people who went up, and they didn't go up, uh, they didn't go up and get uh, campaigned on state issues. They went up and campaigned, won by talking about federal issues, Pelosi. I mean, I couldn't believe it. And they got up there and they tried to write federal laws. Now, when they got up there, there was a, a particular a hangman type thing. Um, and so they did a lot of things that were really crazy. But guess what? Now, when you start cutting so much without balance, it's coming back to the city. And all of a sudden... Right. Well, well, the first first term we saw the problem of of the cutbacks and where they and where the the new Republican majority did this, and they cut back they cut back in areas that when you're trying to make an economy better and trying to make your state better, cutting back the community colleges drastically and the university system when you're trying to educate our people, compete with China and have new jobs is not a very good move. Uh, you know, when when the the things that were were cut. Social programs. Now you say social programs. Okay, a lot of people say that. I, I don't need that social program. We don't need that social program. But you cut it so severely that you turn out mentally ill people onto your streets, and where you didn't have a homeless problem, or people getting bothered in town, or kids running across, you know, and doing vandal. You know, we have a safety net, social safety net, for two reasons. One is to keep the people from falling down, and the other reason is for keep the rest of us underneath the social net from them crashing into us, crashing into a society, disrupting society. It works two ways. And right now, you know, there's always been an argument, I think, between Republicans and Democrats, is that Republicans probably want a little wider net, and the Democrats probably want a little tighter net. But now we've got people who say, no net. No net. Well, no uh, net. And I've, and I've argued this here and, <laughs> and you mentioned can't have, it before. You can't have civilization okay. without some kind of net. The Romans had a net. You know, I mean, you, if you have civilization, you've got to have a net. You've got to, you've got to take care of the people who, who, who need help for themselves, and that depends on the compassion and the policies and everything else of, of, a, of a government, but it also is just for the protection of, of, of everybody else. You were else. there that night when I made the attempt to bring the money back, $441,000, to bring five and a half social workers back to New Hampshire right. from Hillsborough. Uh, they four hundred forty-one thousand dollars. They're yelling and screaming. The Republicans, how much money they save? Social workers step up and say, "Well, wait a minute." We really saved New Hampshire in its totality, a million and a half, just keeping people out of jail. 
Uh, we do have jails uh, right. in, in our area that, uh, that, that we have to pay for. So in a sense, the, the safety net, uh, there the certainly is less of a safety net. And suicides are up, and I mean, it's, it's a bad time to do that. It's uh, uh, good to argue we want to save $441,000. But it's bad to get rid of everything. Well, 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 let me give you an example. I had a constituent who wrote me such a, a passionate uh, email that I, I had her send it to all the, the reps. Basically, she, had a, a, she has a young son who's got uh, mental problems, and, and mental and emotional problems, and he's kicked out of one of these schools as a result of the budget cuts. So, uh, yep. so he, comes, he comes home, um, and she has a daughter who's about, a year younger, she can't leave him with her because he's violent and 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 Needs so what does what does he do? He comes he comes home, he's he freaks out, he runs across the street into a marsh, and he's in this marsh for like six hours and they and they have like four police cars, two rescue crews. They spend the day taking care of taking care of extracting him. Now I think it costs three hundred and forty one bucks a week or something to have him up there. Well it costs thousands and thousands of dollars of national taxpayer money that day, that one day, he's, and he since, she said, had other occasions where the police had to get him, where they had to call rescue. I mean, the, the problems that we try to, to work with economically at the state level become huge problems at the local level. Not to mention she can't leave the child home with, with her daughter, that, that, but it takes our police, our fire, our rescue crews, you know, tons of time. And, and, uh, but, but, but yes, that's not but working. That's, that's, I, I want to point this. See, you're, you're a politician, and you're, you're 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 far more civilized than I am. I want to point the, the 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 finger at the Republicans and say, not all of you, but you voted for these people. Oh This no. is what these people. That's what, that's this what is what these about. people are doing. This is the consequences of the actions. There's consequences of actions. There's consequences of inactions. And this is a direct consequence of action. That's why I had her send that. Uh, Email to all the all the reps so they could see this is this is what happens. This is what it. goes on. Yeah, you saw it too. That's good. Well, that's uh, so. If if you're a I'll, Democrat, I'll, I'll, I'll give you one more bill. Go ahead. This came before our committee. Go ahead. This is this is a great one, um, and it was defended vehemently by several several of our new uh, new colleagues. Uh, they want to put a sign up, uh, 50 feet from the border of every of every part of, of, of where we go into Massachusetts. Saying warning. It was from my committee. And yeah, yeah. It, it, it was mine too. Yeah, entering, entering Massachusetts. Yeah. And you know, my question was uh, do you really think that, that this is going to help our tourism, which is a big part of our state, when we ask these people to come to our state to, uh, to buy our liquor, to buy our cigarettes, to swim in our lakes, to ski in our mountains? Do you really think that's going to be a positive influence on tourism and kind of the general <laughs> cooperation of the states? And, uh, and they thought it was necessary, you know. So, I mean, that's the kind of thinking we have there, which, which is really disturbing to me because it just, it, it has nothing to do with the Republican. Waste of time. But, but, you know, you say Republican, Democrat, it's Republican majority now that's doing it, but I don't think it's the way the Republican Party used to be or probably is at no, its No, no, uh, again, you want to be the politician. No, I, I, just, I want to point and say they voted for him. This is what's taking place. No, you know, voted for they them. Have the, to take the independents. The no, the independents voted for them, and they've got to come. Back. They've got to, and, and the independents is what make up. There. It's a big, big bell curve. In the middle is independents and moderates. Most of the state is moderate, common sense, good, frugal kind of Yankee thinking. I don't care if they came from Massachusetts, New York. They're pretty much that way. We have we have some people have come into the state with a political agenda. They've gotten elected, and if we don't sort them out, things are going to be a lot different around here. Than, than they are well, right when now. I say the Republican Party is hijacked, that's right. That certainly could be one way of looking at it. So, if you're a, a Democrat out there uh, and you haven't done anything, I think it's time you start waking up. And if you are uh, an individual who's in between and not too sure, and you want to be independent, uh, time to look at the Rep uh, Democratic Party. And if you're a Republican out there, we're not that happy. It's now time to 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 come over to this way. Maybe uh, send a message. To what's going on? Oh, it's awful. It's just awful. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I have a, you have some bills coming up? I've got a couple bills coming up. Let's hear about yours. All right. Uh, we have a teacher's bill. Yeah. A very uh, teacher's uh, protection bill. And uh, you know how it is to get, to get a bill. Right. So the individual who brought the bill brought it in for a former representative. Uh, McGuire now has it. I was second you know, signed up on it. McGuire would come and drop it, run away. 
I would bring in from the teachers, the administrators, to the unions. So we went through one committee and it passed. That was last year. They put in another committee. So it went in the other committee and it passed the committee. It goes to the Senate. The Senate, I think, voted it was five or seven to one that they were going to recommend the whole Senate was going to, to vote for it. These great Republicans, and I'm sorry if I have to mention Republicans, wanted to change three words. So they have a committee of conference, you know what that is, and they start arguing with the Republicans. What they are the three arguing. words, by the way? Oh, it, it, it's so, All right. just so mundane. You know when a law is made, and you have to make a law where there is no, as little interpretation as, as, yeah. as always. These words were going to give more of an interpretation. Yeah. So I did all that work. We did all that work. I, I'm not the only one. I mean, I did bring people, etc. And I couldn't believe it, running it twice, getting it passed twice, getting it passed in the Senate, basically. And so this year, it's interesting because, of course, my name is there with about 30 other names, and everybody now wants to do it, and everybody's talking about right. it, and it, it's going to happen. And, and what it basically says is that if a teacher gets in between two children or, or, or kids and puts their hands out to stop them, that's not an assault. No. If you're, somebody is being beat up on the ground Otherwise, they'd be, pull finding, one they'd, be, off. they'd be finding the referees at NHL games. Right. <laughs> you know? They're breaking up the fights. Yeah. They're not part of them. <laughs> well, the, 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 it's a big problem because the, the administration is saying, go, if you see a fight, don't go stop well, it. That's go probably, get help. That's probably for their own safety, though, right? No. Actually, that's uh, because everybody's worried about getting sued. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I see. It's not safety. Because yeah. if, if somebody's getting beat up, yeah. uh, you or I are there, we're not going to think about it. We're just going to break it up. Right, right. So that's one of the bills coming up. And the other bill is in the Bureau of Securities. And I, as you know, I was on, uh, I'm in Commerce. Uh, and last year we did the FRM, which was the largest. And you were on the special committee, though. Yeah, special that, committees, et cetera. And uh, so I got one of the bills. And by the way, this is a book uh, by uh, Conley, who was the uh, head of securities. Yeah. And my name's in it. Uh, in a positive way, but actually, I worked with a Republican who had been there for 10 years, Rip Holden. Sure. I sort of carried the water. But it's an interesting book if people really good. want I, to I, see. Good. I look forward to reading it. It's got good reviews in the back, and I know Mark Connolly, and he, he's uh, being praised by the, the people that read this, Mark Spitzer, and, uh, and the person who did the whistleblowing of Bernie, Bernie Madoff and others. So, and Ken Gidge is in here, huh? Yeah. I, Great. Yeah, yeah, but it, you know, here I am complaining about Republicans. If it wasn't for Rip Holden, who uh, basically I carried the water, because he'll say differently. Right, right. But I, I found that. Uh, that. So those are the two bills I have coming up. What do you see in the future uh, coming down that uh, either upsets you or makes you feel good that's uh, taking place uh, uh, here in the state? Well, right now, not not a lot's making me feel good. I'm just kind of concerned that we're we're going down a path that doesn't seem to be very productive in terms of jobs, the economy. Of course, I'm for uh, bringing uh, 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 increased, uh, you know, a, a casino to to, uh, to the state because I think we need revenue. We have a revenue problem. Uh, the, the problem, the, the the structure of the New Hampshire uh, state revenue system is because we have no income tax and no sales tax, which nobody wants, and that's not an issue. But but because we have business taxes and liquor sales and rooms and meals tax, we are very sensitive to economic ups and downs. So uh, unlike other states, which can kind of ride these things out, they still have dips, but ours, our, our revenue structure took a real dip. We need some more reliable revenue sources. Now, Massachusetts uh, has passed the casino bill. They've become the 41st state to have casino gambling. And the sky has not fallen in any of these other states, but you think it is going to fall here talking to some of the opponents of it. The problem is, especially for those that live on the border, like Nashua, is that when they put in those casinos in, in uh, Massachusetts, there's no wall between the two states. They say that $80 million of New Hampshire money goes to gambling right now, it goes out of state, most of it to, to Connecticut, the Mohegan Sun to Foxwoods, yeah. the rest of it to Vegas and other places. But they say when the studies have shown that when they put in the casino down in Massachusetts, 
It's either going to be at Suffolk Downs or, or Foxwoods, the big one. That, that, that 80 million is going to go to 120 million. And those dollars are going to go to the general fund coffers, not of New Hampshire, but of Massachusetts. So we are going to lose in our own revenue structure. If we do nothing, talk about, talk about the consequences of inaction. If we do nothing, just let Massachusetts go ahead with their plan, which in two or three years will have casinos. And that's already passed, by the way. It's not speculation. That's fact. That's reality. When that happens, we are going to lose $70 million a year in our own revenue structure right away. That's from reduced rooms and meals tax, and that's from reduced lottery sales. $70 million a year, $140 million a biennium. That means more cutbacks in education, more cutbacks in social programs, more cutbacks in, in a state government that just can't take much more because we, haven't, we never had excessive fat in our state government. Oh, it's, it's always been a lean state. Yes, it's always but been to a some state. people. Well, you know, but, 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 even, but not very many people that can point to, like, this is not Massachusetts. But the New Hampshire advantage is about to become the Massachusetts advantage for the very simple reason that we, we're letting them have the bills or not. Now, here's the worst statistic of all. The Center for Public Policy, which is the, which is the darling of the opponents of gaming, and they, they have said all along there's going to be these social ills that are going to accumulate in our state should we have gaming. By the way, we do have gaming. Oh, yes. Yes. We, we have. <clears throat> yes. Want to go through them? Bingo. We have uh, scratch tickets. We have Lucky 7 tickets. We have lottery tickets. We have um, casino nights for charity, which are very slimly regulated and even less enforced. God knows what's happening at that's those. That's right. That's right. So all those. We have poker so rooms. We have poker rooms. All yeah. those things. Okay? So that's going on now. But, and the social ills are calculated at a certain amount. Well, if it goes into Massachusetts, they're saying that we get 75% of the ills and 0% of the revenue. Ah, in fact, that's we, right. I we get, we get negative way. revenue. So it's a difference between losing $70 million a year and with just one casino, maybe getting $150 million. So it's a swing of like $200 million a year every year. Can we afford to do that? Can we afford not to do it? And, I, you know, I, and, if we put a casino down in Rockingham Park, for instance, which is kind of a logical place for it, and it's going to go out to bid, but I'm just thinking, we've been gambling in Rockingham Park since the early 1900s. That's right. And, and the infrastructure is there. We could probably be up and running there in a short period. But if a casino was there, do you know where most of the people that gamble are going to come from? They're not going to come from New Hampshire. They're going to come from Massachusetts and out of state. We're going to attract out of state money into our coffers instead of having our money sucked out into others. And it just seems so logical to me especially in the face of reality. If we're living on an island, do you want casino gambling or not? Probably not. We're not living on an island. We're living in a state that has casinos in Connecticut, Maine. They just, they just uh, passed, they're gonna put a major casino in Augusta. Uh, and, and now Massachusetts, our, our, our direct neighbor that we share a big border with. How, how can we run from these, these facts and these numbers and, and lose more sustainable revenue which have to be made up in budget cuts. And by the way, even if you don't believe in all those budget cuts and you say, okay, cut education, cut that. Well, you know what else happens as a result of, of reduced revenues at the state level? It means that these costs are passed down to the local community. Oh, that's and right. that means your that's property right. taxes go up. That's right. And this last budget, the property taxes right. went up. And every time we have to cut back at the state level, it means even though there's a constitutional amendment against directly doing that, believe me, Talk to any mayor, any board of selectmen, they'll tell you that every year the state's shuffling more costs off to the counties and more off to the towns and cities, and you see that in your property tax bill. I never, if for people who are against gambling, and one of the big reasons is, is that if you have gambling, more gambling in the state, there will be corruption, et cetera. Since gambling will be so close to us, as you have said, we're still going to have the ills of it. Well, the ills are so, the social ills are basically addictive gambling. That's what they're talking about. Uh, the, the, <clears throat> the crime and those things, there's, there's been no, no statistical evidence of that. And we have gambling right now, as we just talked about. We have all those, we have gambling right now. And when you have a casino, you have strictly regulated uh, situation with, you know, anybody who's been to a casino knows you've got the eye in the sky, the, the chance of crime happening in the premises are zero. What's happening in the parking lots of these other places, these poker games and these, you know. That's right. I mean, we have no regulation. We have no enforcement. Uh, you know, we're getting the best, the worst of all worlds and none of, none of the benefits. And it just, you know, again, uh, this one cuts across party lines. You can't even talk about Republican or Democrat when it comes to this issue. But I think you can talk about being in the southern tier where we're going to see 
this money shoot down? It's going to hurt us yeah. the most. Yeah. We, we've, we've received so much with uh, people coming over and not paying uh, taxes on, on lots of goods. Uh, now, they'll be very happy to pay the taxes. I mean, big hotels. And, you know, it's not just gambling. I mean, when somebody walks in and they put a half a billion or three quarters of a billion down to build something, yes, it is for gaming, no question. It's the best of the restaurants, four-star restaurants. It's the best of the hotels. It's yeah. the best of, of uh, playing vacations. I mean, it, but the thing about the thing about g the gaming is, unlike any other tax, totally voluntary. I don't like to gamble. Then you don't have to go, and you'll still reap the the revenue awards of that. 2,000 jobs. One casino will bring in 2,000 permanent jobs. And those aren't minimum wage jobs. A lot of those are good jobs. You know, we have a bad economy. We need jobs in the state. We need out-of-state money. We need jobs. This is one way to do it. It is not a panacea. It is not going to solve all the problems. But it seems to me to do the other, especially when the negative impact is so great, kind of calls out that we should do the right thing. Well, David, uh, believe it or not, it's been an hour. I believe it. Uh, it went fast. It went fast. It you, always does with you, Ken. I mean, it was, it's amazing because he sits down here and you get nervous that I'm going to do something very silly. I haven't done anything silly as, as of yet. How, but, how much time we got left? Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> we have as much time as I want. Yeah. But uh, you must come back yeah. and uh, maybe even have your own show, which yeah. would be good. Yeah, we've talked about that. That's right. Uh, so uh, I want to thank you. And also thank you. Uh, to the people out there, uh, if you want to get in touch with me, it is Ken Gage. Uh, well, it would be K-G-I-D-G-E. That would be email, K-G-I-D-G-E at AOL.com. Or go to GidgeWorld.com, believe it or that's not. That's easy to remember. And also, if you go to Gidge World YouTube, we have a whole show that's uh, on YouTube. And, of course, we're all on the legislative uh, uh, site for if you, New Hampshire House. If you want of, to get in uh, touch with us. All of our uh, emails and, yeah. and numbers are there. Correct. So. And Facebook also, if somebody would like to uh, uh, get me on Facebook or befriend me. Uh, are you on Facebook, by the way? I, I'm not, actually. Sorry. With a face like that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 I knew yeah, that was okay. coming. I guess we're going to have the show all like right. that. All right. Uh, thank you very much. I thank do, you. I do appreciate, appreciate it. it. No, it's and, great. Uh, thank for you. you out for there, uh, if I thought, if you think I'm picky on Republicans, uh, David has uh, calmed me down. I would have uh, gone at it more. I believe that the party has been, uh, in a sense, uh, through free staters and whatever, has been hijacked. And that's, I think that's sad. Things are so much to an extreme. But no snow. But it's snowing outside, so I think Richard here. We want to thank Richard, who's doing the engineering. Yes, thank and you, Richard. Uh, uh, Dave, again, uh, thank you. And till next week, thank you very much. This is Ken Gidge, and this has been Gidge World.